Welcome to the Performance Anxiety Podcast on the Pantheon Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mark. Before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, AKG, for sending us their Podcaster Essentials Kit. As you've heard me say many, many times, it is the best way to get started with your own podcast if you've ever thought about doing so. It comes with a Lira mic and an amazing set of headphones, and it's the most economical, best-sounding way to get your own podcast started. Norman Westberg is my guest today. And this episode went to a few places I wasn't expecting. At first, we discussed his entry into music and how he really wanted to play drums, but a photo of Mark Farner from Grand Funk Railroad made him rethink that idea. But he actually started off playing bass in his bands until the Stooges made him realize that he could really play guitar in a band. And this is where we take a left turn. Norman joined Swans when original member Sue Hannell left. Her story is a mystery, and Norman and I talk about how she's just slowly disappeared. But once we get back on track, Norman tells me that one of his favorite gigs was an early one, and he also tells me why it's his favorite. We also touch on a lot of his other projects like Hidden Rifles, Sugar Time, Five Dollar Priest, and a lot more. He also tells me how Thor Harris made him a guitar out of mahogany. Now, Norman's got a lot of solo work, and much of it is ambient. He tells me how he got started in that genre and about his process of writing, recording, and performing the music live. So find him on Facebook or Bandcamp and check out his albums on Etsy as well, especially if you like bespoke packaging. Follow us at Performance ANX on social media and you can help support the show at performanceanx.threadless.com for merch or ko-fi.com slash performanceanxiety if you just feel like a one-time pick-me-up-with-some-coffee. Then look for us on the Wisdom app too. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Norman Westberg on Performance Anxiety, part of the Pantheon Podcast Network. All right. Just go? Yeah, I'm I'm ready for you. All right. Hi, this is Norman Westberg. Plays in Swans, uh, Heroin Cheeks, Five Dollar Priest, solo music on Bandcamp. Look me up. I'm talking to Mark on... um, Short attention span theater. Hey. <laughs> um, no social. Uh, let's see. I can't remember. My memory is just like. Oh, no, but I have to get that right, right? Uh. I'm cheating. I'm trying to find a. Okay, let me do it again. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm talking to Mark Shea on performance anxiety. My name is Norman Westberg, uh, guitar player, Swans, Heroin Sheiks. You can find my solo music, Ambient, on uh, Bandcamp. Thanks a lot. I just listened to the Mark Farner podcast you did. Oh, awesome. Because he was the one I, I knew his name. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, other people I didn't know anybody. I don't know a lot of people anymore. Oh, if you go back, you find uh, Jarbo and Michael Girard, too. Right. And I had Dana Schechter on not too long ago. Well, I guess it's a little while ago now. Uh, Marco Portia. He did that Swans documentary. Oh, Marco, of course. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. And then uh, Dana was going to be touring with Swans playing some bass be- right before uh, COVID hit. Right, exactly. So uh, this is like the sixth Swans related episode I've had. Wow. Which, which is like more than any other band. <laughs> wow. And I've only recently gotten into Swans. So it's a pretty unique phenomenon there. Oh, huh. and where are you? I am in Winchester, Virginia. Oh, okay. So I'm uh, about 75 miles due west of D.C., just over the same mountain. Time same time zone. Yes. Uh, Mark, hold on. Yes, sir. I, mean, I can't talk. I'm in the middle of a podcast. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting calls now. Okay, sorry <laughs> about that. How did you get into music in the first? I mean, because you, you you grew up in Detroit, right? And uh, yes, was the West Side. Was there a lot of music in the house, or or was there something no, that really no music. really? No. That's funny because there wasn't. No, I'm not really from a musical family. My I'm the, like an extra kid, so I have an older brother who would, I believe is 15 or 16 years older than me. Wow! And my nearest sister is 10 years older than me, and. Wow. and he had records like the Beatles. Like we would go, and my other sister is two years younger than my brother. 
So, you know, they're all older than me. Okay. And uh, we would go get Beatles. They would buy the Beatles singles. So I was obsessed with those records. I asked them if I could play the record players. My brother claims that I destroyed his record collection when I was a little kid, <laughs> but I don't remember that. <laughs> My brother says he at that famous Wayne State MC5 gig. You know that black and white? Yeah. Yeah, he says he was at that. Wow. As I sent him the documentary, he goes, oh, yeah, I was at that. Oh, my God. He goodness. turned me on to some stuff. Like, he knew about music and stuff. And really? he's very supportive. They all love Oh, well, that's good. That's good. I like it's, it's good when you when you have a, a supportive family about like that. I try to do that with my own kids. So. Right. What really turned you on to want to play music and, and was guitar your first? It's so funny because you did the Mark Farner thing. My wife reminded me because I told her the story. When I was a little kid, I'd watch the dating game and the winner won a trip to New York to go to Madison Square Garden and see Grand Funk Railroad. <laughs> and they showed this picture of, you know, the famous picture of Mark Farner bending over with oh, the hair. Yeah. I'm like, oh, God, that's, that's the best thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I, so I went to a record store. I think I bought the live record. Oh, wow. And I still listen to that. Was so that was a, a huge, that was one of the things. Was guitar the first uh, instrument that you picked up? I, I think I wanted to play drums because I always felt the drummers were the coolest guys. Oh, like, wow. I loved Ringo. And even, I don't know the drummer in the Herman's Hermits, but I thought he was really cool. And Charlie, and like, I yeah. really liked it. So I wanted to play drums and in elementary school, but my mom said, well, you want to play guitar, you have to wait another year. Because if we spend the money to buy your drum equipment stuff, we, you won't be able to do the guitar stuff. So I waited for oh. the guitar oh, wow. another year. Because, you know, they rented me a guitar. And I went to the lessons every Saturday. Oh, how old were you around that time? Well, I was hanging out with my buddies. I had braces. <laughs> I guess I must have been 11 or 12. And we were pretty independent. You know, it was a fantastic neighborhood. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had my group of friends and we played sports and did everything together. And I decided I wanted to play guitar, so... And the music store was right up the street. I could walk there. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, and your parents would let you go at that that time. Yeah. Now they won't let you go anywhere. They almost, yeah, you can't really. It's, yeah, it's. Yeah, it was a much different time. When did you start playing with other people and, and playing in bands? In, um, not in high school, after high school. Like the guy I was in the first band with, was my friend in high school, but uh, it was after high school that we got together with oh. a guy I met at the punk rock club. And I said, oh yeah, I played guitar. We actually played together before we met that guy. Oh, really? Like, kind of pre-punk rock. We were doing like Aerosmith and Montrose and some Alice Cooper. I played bass originally, oh, but wow. then I heard the Stooges and I went, forget the bass, I can play this on guitar. Yeah. <laughs> and I started work, we started working on all our Stooges songs. And you eventually moved to New York City. Was that, when was, how old were you? And, and what was the draw for New York? 1980. Okay. Uh, my girlfriend in Detroit, my first actual like real girlfriend moved to New York because I guess she wanted to be an actress. Ah. And uh, I had been, I was playing in bands in New York, the same band, Route 666 was our name. Oh, wow. <laughs> We're on a compilation, a punk rock archives Detroit compilation, if you want to hear it, you can look it up. Oh, yeah. Um, Detroit, uh, I think it's just called Punk Rock Archives. And it's a double record of all the Detroit bands happening then. And the guy approached me. I only had a rehearsal tape. Um, Robert St. Mary is the guy who put it together. And it's really cool. So it's actually on there. You can hear it. It was all downstrokes and like very misfitty. Yeah. <laughs> we really liked the misfits, though we had never seen them. But we had the singles. So yeah, I moved to New York because of her. And also you kind of had a choice back then. Like LA was where New York was more arty. So I felt I would fit in better there. 
And that's I came to New York and I started doing a lot of auditions. I would go and do like cold auditions for, for people. That oh, really? Fun. Uh, on guitar? Yeah, I would. I just answered the ads in the wow. Village Voice. Oh. At one point, I talked to Tommy Victor, I guess, because I was way into Killing <laughs> Joke and Pill. And uh, they had an ad in the paper looking for a guitar player. I think he was playing with Marilyn and the Movie Stars. Wow. And I called. I think I talked to him. And we'd agree, because I'm friends with Tommy when we were hanging out. We agree that it was him I spoke to. <laughs> Oh, man. But I never auditioned for them because I think they had got somebody or they broke up or they did oh. something. Oh. But I auditioned for people I ended up playing with. One of the bands I auditioned with was what was another kind of like Live Skull. Oh, yes. The same people, basically. It was called Body. Oh, wow. And uh, it was a different band. And then I became friends with the drummer, Ivan Mayhem. And uh, I didn't get the job. But he called me up and we formed the band. Oh, okay. What, what, what band was that? That was Carnival Crash. Carnival, okay. I saw that. What was the sound of Carnival Crash? I don't know. We were way into like, like Joy Division. Ah. And it was kind of that kind of thing and Killing Joke. And I always think Detroit guitar players sound like Detroit guitar players. So for me, it was that kind of thing. How long before you end up playing in Swans? I think that was around 83. I knew Harry Crosby. Well, I had met Harry Crosby because Carnival Crash had did a gig at this basement apartment that he lived at. He was the doorman. And I liked him. I was talking to him, and I knew he hung out at this one bar. And I went into the bar one day, and I said, oh, where's Harry? And the bartender told me that he was on tour. I was like, really? No way. You don't go on tour. I had no idea that you could actually do that. And uh, sure enough, he came back, and I saw him in the bar, and he went, oh, you should come and audition for this band. I went, great. And I went and I auditioned wow. for Swans, and that was it. Oh, my gosh. That's because I didn't do the first Swans tour. That was Sue. Right. I heard some just wild stories. I mean, the, the, her, her story is just amazing. I mean, she just vanished, from what I understand. She vanished as far as everybody knows, I guess. I was talking to, I think when I had Wharton Tears on, he was talking a little bit about that. Yeah. He mentioned that he's just kind of saw her a few times and she kept deteriorating. And then one day she, he just, she was just gone. Yeah. We would run into her. There were uh, Catherine and Nicholas would host pasta dinners up at their apartment. So everybody would go. Sue was there for, I know one that I was at and I didn't go to those till I was a member of Swans. And she came to a couple Swans gigs I saw her at, and she did a she did a recording at Wharton Tears Studio, where John Erskine was putting together uh, like you go and you play. I think it was a Bob Dylan song that I played on. Oh wow! And Sue played on it too. I think I've heard one track with her on it post Swans, and it was on. I, I, gosh, I don't even remember what it was. But it was incredible. I mean, it was just so thick and noisy and just amazing. Right. I
she played through, I think, an acoustic bass amp, because that's what I played through when I auditioned. Oh, wow. And I eventually played through bass amps, too, you know, because you want that low end and you don't want it to fall apart. And uh, I think pictures I've seen, I think some like a Les Paul studio, maybe? I think, Somewhere yeah, I, I think so. I've only seen a couple of photos, but I, I think yeah. that's what she had. Yeah, something like that. It's unbelievable. I, I would love to know more about her, what, you know, her and find and if there's any well, other so, recordings. Uh, all I know is she's a bike messenger. Yep. And I don't know if anything else she did. Man, that's heartbreaking. Ugh. So much talent there, so much unbelievable music that, she, that, from what I heard anyway, I mean, it's just, so with Swans, I mean, if they were part of the, the no wave scene, the short lived no wave scene, how much input did you guys have in the music? I know, you know, it's, it's kind of the brainchild of, of Michael, but going back and listening to stuff of that time period, I don't hear anything that really compares to Swans. I mean, sure. How did the, the music evolve? I mean, was it something, was Michael saying, hey, this is the sound I want, let's work on it? Or was it of a group effort? He played bass. So what would happen in the beginning is he'd go in and he'd have a bass thing and then you play. You'd come up with something. And then he's like, yeah. And I would like do, okay, maybe I could do this too. And it's like, but I liked about, at Swans at that point, there was no key or anything. It wasn't until Al came into the band who really knew how to play yeah. that I had to pay more attention to, you know, actually playing <laughs> something that made more sense. Okay. okay. I was just thinking about this as I was going back and listening to the, as much of the discography as I could, because it's quite ex extensive. But if you go back to what's on the radio in 83 and it's all sugary pop stuff and even the harder stuff was nothing like swans i mean a song like gang does not sound like it was recorded in 1983 It could come out years later and, and sound more contemporary a decade later than it did in 83. It was, it, to me, it's but unreal. You could still listen to college radio back then, right? I mean, I didn't at some point, FMU, you know, they play stuff. And there was a lot of music like I had never heard of. I was in a good situation and Michael turned me on. Like I had never heard of SBK. And he went, oh yeah, you should listen to this. I was wow. like, wow, this is insane. <laughs> That's just the way it goes. You're playing, playing, and then somebody, you run across something, or somebody turns you on to something. I try to keep yeah. my ears open for stuff like that. The early live shows must have been incredible because the albums are relentless. I mean, they're just pummeling. Hearing all that live must have been just an, a, an incredible experience. Uh, maybe. <laughs> well, you, yeah, you're on the other end of it. I mean, my absolute favorite gig of all time was the end of the first European tour with Roly playing drums. Okay. So it was a four piece, Michael and Harry, me and Roly. And we opened for the fall at Heaven in London. Oh, wow. And it was captive audience and their fall fans. And oh, did they hate us. <laughs> Just... And we got into this thing. It was Roly's idea of don't make any sound at all. You know how bands come up and they tune up and they drum their drums? Yeah. No sound. So we came out, no sound at all. And just right when we hit, the audience kind of did one of these and then went, ah. <laughs> they hated us so much. They hated us. Oh, my gosh. I, I really enjoyed that game. I can imagine. Oh, my gosh. That would be amazing. But there was an audience, too. We also played to six people somewhere in Germany, and we played to, like, no people in other places. I've heard that. that. I've heard that, and I don't remember exactly what era of, of Swans it was, but 
that you guys were playing in like Eastern Bloc countries and getting smuggled in to play like basement shows in, in Eastern Bloc countries? I was with Al and Jarbo. That was like a Children of God tour. Okay. With, yeah. That's. And Ron, I think, the two drummer tour. We went into Czech, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. Wow. They were going to tie the back of our van together, but there was they couldn't figure out a way to do it. Wow. And we had to move gigs a couple times, I think, because somebody had found out authorities, so we moved to someplace else. Man. Yeah, it was interesting. That, yeah. <laughs> that album was a huge shift in sound, too, at that point. Was that a conscious thing that you guys wanted to do uh, with Children of God? Yeah, but it was still kind of the, the same thing. We'd go in and there'd be the idea Michael would come up with something on keyboards since there were keyboards now. Okay. Yeah. Or you have an idea and we play and that was it. That's it. And, but he had guitar <laughs> too. You know, he would play guitar and we would follow that or go off of it. After such like the first few albums were such an onslaught, you know, sure. to have softer metal you know songs yeah. come in. It was it was it sound like it, it to me it would have been a huge shift in sound. And uh, was it well received? That record was, yeah. The quieter songs were really never that quiet. You know, they just seemed a little more possibly gentle. I'm not sure if you would use that term, but right <laughs> now, I they mean, some of the just weren't the same kind of like brutal, uh, yeah, kind. Of yeah, I mean, songs crashing. like "Our Love Lies," uh, "Real Love," uh, "Trust Me." are just incredible songs and much different from yeah like well you have Filth to have progress michael's progressed a lot it but yeah and it's like, able to come to, to communicate with more of what he's looking for that makes a lot of sense that i've heard the burning world is a very polarizing album for a lot of swans fans what did you like it i mean i know it, it's, it has some really beautiful stuff on it even though the cover is a, is kind of a departure from what what right. swans were doing it was yes the tour was really good very dynamic because it's back to being more live but that was totally really a studio record we were not playing live in the studio oh okay like before for the most part like the early the first two records were set up in this giant studio yeah. and maybe do some overdubs like you would do back in the old day, try to get the bass and drum tracks. And then, you know, if the guitars were good, you keep them. Right. And then go in and, and do some stuff again, if it warrants it. But a lot of it was about the performance. Then. And then it becomes more about the studio. And like I spent two days sitting there, they did playing guitar to a drum machine, basically. And then they did. I enjoyed the record. But it, not necessarily, it's not really, yeah. As far as the Swans records, it's kind of like a weird sore thumb there, isn't it? Yeah. People, that's their favorite record, some people I talk to. It's very accessible. Yeah, it really, it, it seems to go one of two ways. Either it's like, it's way up in their top or it's like one of the ones they like the least. It's never seems to be in the middle. Like, ah, it's okay. Yeah. So, and even the, the Maplethorpe cover. It's a beautiful, I mean, Robert Maplethorpe was an incredible photographer, but, you know, even the cover art was, was quite a departure from stuff before yeah. and since. That was quite a transitional time period for Michael and what he decides he wants to do with Swans. Oh, absolutely. And then the, the Blind Faith cover. The first time I went and looked up the album and went to listen to it, I wasn't prepared for Swans doing a Blind Faith cover.
you're really pretty much exactly straight too. Yeah. It was like a, a weird version of it. Exactly. <laughs> then you guys kind of, I don't know. I, the, this was the, the first album I actually ever heard from Swans was White Light from the Mouth of Infinity. Yeah, I'm out by then. Okay. Oh, you're out by then. I'm out. I oh. play on the first song, but I'm out after the Burning World tour. maybe on my way out anyway it's like that not realizing that you basically spent a whole life of nothing happening right you know when you play music yeah. it's like after the moments i mean you just do what you do so okay so you were out now it, it's showing that you have you're credited on that album i mean was michael taking parts from stuff you'd recorded earlier or was it maybe but i do play on the first song okay i think it's when that album came out, that was the first time I'd, I'd heard Swans. And uh, I was kind of spooked me a little bit. And I never went back until a few years ago. And uh, huh. I started getting in, into Swans a few years ago, thinking, crap, I missed all of this. <laughs> so, unfortunately, it's a lot. It's changed a lot over the years. It, for sure. it really has. I mean, even, even from like White Light from the Mouth of Infinity to. Like soundtracks for the blind and, and my father will guide me up a rope to the sky. Everything, even those are big shifts in sound. Yeah. When did you come back to Swans? Which album was it? Uh, it was it great annihilator? Yes, we did the great Al and Ted and I, we did some great annihilator recording recorded here in New York and then went to Chicago and recorded. And I am Times. Was that when you were in the heroin chic? No, um, it was oh, pre heroin chics. Okay. I was probably playing with Al and something. Okay. Because we always keep playing together in some band or other. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. I want to take a minute and talk about our sponsor, TS to T. Tiesta is a tea company on a mission to create loose leaf tea beverages with premium ingredients that taste good and do good. Each tea is blended for one of five categories so you can energize, slenderize, boost antioxidants, boost immunity, and relax. My current favorite is Blueberry Wild Chow. You know, when I was growing up, my dad always told me, once you go loose, you never go bagged. And you know what? He was right. Go to tiestatea.com and use the promo code ANXIETY15 at checkout to get 15% off your order. Think you know tea? You haven't tried Tiesta tea. So what, what were you doing in the time after you left Swans? What, was, what did you decide to do? Nothing. We, uh, I hung out with Al, and I think we were playing together. And then uh, we did this, some fetus touring. We toured with Jim. Okay. And then uh, I got into Sugar Sign, was a band with Jason Asnes from Nice Strong Arm, who was on the Burning World record. Just 
he was in Swans very briefly. Okay. No live shows. And uh, yeah, Sugar Time. We did two singles, played around New York. Oh, wow. Okay. Maybe a year. But that was back when, I mean, we rehearsed all the time. Like every night we would rehearse. I don't really do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little harder with kids and stuff. <laughs> it's just, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> There is a big hiatus between Swan's albums, between Soundtracks for the Blind and then My Father Will Guide Will, get, will Guide Me Up a Rope to the Sky. There's like 14 years in there, I believe, right? Great Annihilator. Uh, I don't know the timeline. Let me pull up real quick. Let me take a look here. Um, so at that time, it goes from Great Annihilator yeah, was 95, I... Soundtracks for the Blind was 96, and then 2010. Right. For My Father Will Guide Me Up a Rope to the Sky, which is one of the longest album titles I've ever had to say in a podcast. <laughs> you played in some really interesting other bands at that point. I'm going to pull my notes back up out of the... Off the Caroline Sheets, $5 and Priest. And Five dollars, yes. I should have killed somebody, but I, I said I never would. I should have killed somebody. I, I, I kind of want to say out of left field. It's a very different sound from Heroin Sheiks and, um, well, the solo stuff and, and Hidden Rifles. Which, oh, Hidden Rifles. Oh, really? Hidden, Rifle. Hidden Rifles is awesome. <laughs> Love that. In fact, I, I mentioned to a couple of, of previous guests that you were coming on, and um, one of them, a guy named uh, Oh Steve Tulipana from um, Season to Risk, he said to say hello. Yeah. He did want to know a little a bit about that, how that got started, how Hidden Rifles came to be, and uh, how did you meet Mike Watt, and how did that project get started? I didn't meet Mike Watt. He flew in his bass parts. Oh. He's a busy guy. You know he plays. And we only ever did, there was one show we did when Matt came to town, but we didn't do any of the songs. We just <laughs> made up new stuff. <laughs> and it was really fun. John Colpitz, I think, uh, Kid Millions played drums on that. He plays on quite a few of that, those records. Yeah, I did see that. Um, I don't know. I think Waskovich came to a Cleveland Swan show, and then he reached out and asked me if I would you know, play some guitar stuff. Hey, well, that works. I, th I think it's a great album. Huh. I only found out about it a few days ago when Steve sent me the uh, question, and uh, I think huh. I could look this up. And it's, huh. it's really great stuff. Huh. All right, so back to Swans for a minute. Or uh, I guess let's go back to the gap years here. Um, so Heroin Sheiks, was that one of the first things that you recorded after Swans? Was that one of the first recording bands that you were in? No. Right after Swans would be Sugar Time. And then there was a long gap. I was, you know, I played with Al. I did some other thing. I didn't play. I just kind of walked around, I guess. <laughs> and um, at some point, you know, I was seeing bands. And I decided, I think I had just quit my long-standing job. That would have been 99. Oh, wow. The, the two years of 98, 99. So I, I quit this job that I had forever, and I was like, what do I do? So I, I got this other job, but then I said, you know what? I want to go on tour. Who do I know? And we had been playing softball, and I knew George Proferis okay. from Heroin Sheiks. Right. And I said, oh, I know what bar he hangs out with. I'm going to ask him if I, when I see him, you know, what's going on? And sure enough, he goes, oh, I got this band. You should come and play. And I went down to the rehearsal studio and played, and it was like, oh, yeah, it's great. 
I was listening to that actually today at work. Uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of the song. Uh, Nuclear Genie. Genie, yes. Is such a cool track. One of their hits. There's a few that well, I played on the two records, Siamese Pipe. Yes. And Death on the Installment Plan. Yeah. Or Rape, oh, on, Rape the on the Installment Plan. Yeah. I'm sorry. And that both of those, John Fell played drums. Then there's a single, earlier single, uh, that the guy who called me just yeah. now played on. Oh, really? I, yeah, he played on that single. He oh. wasn't the original drummer, he was the second drummer. And then there was a little thing happened, and then my buddy John Fell came in. Okay. Super drummer John Fell. After a while, so you're playing in in a bunch of bands here, uh, and that was only a couple of years. I think it was. I know uh, 2001 we did a tour. So around 2003, it was probably over for me. Once again, I, I walked away. I just said, you know what, this isn't doing it for me anymore. I'm not having fun. Oh, that's wow. what you're supposed to. You're supposed to have fun. Yeah, exactly. You're supposed to have fun. I saw something, and and you, maybe you can help me with the timeline on this because apparently I'm getting a few things wrong here. Thanks, Wikipedia. Cripple and the burnout. Oh yeah. When when what time frame was that? That was, I think I was. That was while Swans was happening. Okay. I don't even know what year that record. What year does it say the record came out? Uh, let me let me pull it back up here. Uh, Crippled in the burnout. Let's see. Um, Michael Dwayne from Dust Devils playing on that. Nineteen ninety three. Yeah. Okay. There so we go. yeah, that was uh, just around I guess Sugar Time days. Okay. And, um, yeah, that was a, a friend who just said, "Hey, I'm I'm doing this. I want to do a single." Will you play? I got Michael Dwayne. I like Michael Dwayne. I knew him for years before that. I'm like, yeah, I want to do that. So yeah. that's a cool single. James, I... Lowe, James Lowe played drums, but he didn't use his real name. I think he's a little embarrassed by it. <laughs> I like it. It's on YouTube. I like it a lot. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, the audio is on YouTube. Yeah, there was never a gig or anything. Right, right. Yeah, the uh, yeah. the audio from the single. I still yeah. Talk. I talked to him. So it's Ambulance Driver and, and Bitch Saloon Romance. Those are just really cool tracks, man. Yeah, that was, that was fun to do. I mean, we just, it's kind of cool. You know, you learn two songs, just work on the two songs, go in the studio, record them. When Michael, I, I guess maybe the better way to phrase this is, how are you contacted about doing the Swans album that, you know, after such a great gap in time? I think it, once again, I was like not doing anything. Yeah. And nothing was happening. I already... I believe Nina was already born, my daughter. So that would have been 12 years ago. And I want to do something. Maybe Michael wants to do something because we had just seen him solo. So it wasn't like we were on you know, non-speaking terms or we had any issues with each other. Okay. And I called him up and said, yeah, if you are doing something, let me know. And then he called me back and said, yeah, I want to get this thing together. And again, the sound kind of progressed more the albums from that time on have a huge sprawling sound that the tracks, a lot of the tracks are longer and more intense. Yeah. Well, that's because the band learned to, we all learned to play together because it was the same band. It was the longest running Swans band. Ah. I'm fairly sure, you know, with the steady band members. Okay. I mean, 
songs like like uh, she loves us bring the sun to saint louverture louverture the glowing yeah. man which is a personal favorite of mine just for the that brutal middle section No, I've never had a chance. I was hoping they're very all this stuff is completely different live. Those I, are studio records. So live it's more uh it's raw. I've I would say. I've talked and talking to Steve and a couple other people who've seen Swans Live, this they, they've told me that it's the loudest show they've ever been to. Yeah, I've heard that, but I, I'm I'm skeptical. <laughs> well, you're on the you're on the stage. <laughs> yeah, it's a little safer there. <laughs> Do you have a a personal favorite Swans album or or song that that you've been involved with? I, I don't know. I always love "Thank You" from the first record. Oh. Blackout was always one of my favorites, even though that was a Sue Hanel era song. Yeah. Blackout. And Thank You was as well. Um, the songs uh, like Wrong Right from the first record, Right Wrong, I'm not sure which way it is, yeah. was one that, you know, I was involved with. You know, even though I never listened to what anybody was doing, yeah. like I don't know what Sue did on Blackout. They would describe, they would go, well, you play low, and then when this part of the song, you go really high. Oh. That was my instruction. So, oh, man. You do whatever you want to do. You just really exciting and fun. Oh, man. That's amazing. The fact that it came together so well, too, is, is just awesome. So that changed a little bit going on forward because, I mean, you can't really do that on a 28 minute song, right? Right. Oh, well, by then it's, um, yeah, Michael is, he's, he's doing everything. I it, mean, we do contribute, but it's all based on his guitar parts. Is that all worked out ahead of time? Is he telling you guys what to do? Or are you working out together as a band in the studio? He's a little bit of that, a little bit of that, but it's not like we're in rehearsal studios coming up with stuff. It's right. we would go and he would introduce the song. We're at the recording studio. Here's the song. What are you going to play? You should play. And then you play some stuff and he goes, Oh, what? are you insane? <laughs> yeah. Maybe try this other thing. Okay. Yeah. So he's, and then you just work it out. So he's kind of got it in his head, what he's trying to get. And well, yeah. I think a lot of times of what you or I would play would go into his head. You go, Oh, that's good. Except you're getting there, making it way too complex. You know, stick with the one thing. Okay. And I did get a chance to see that documentary I was, and I was watching the, that, uh, rehearsal segment that he had and it, man, that it looks intense to prepare for a tour with you guys. It looks, it looks to me, it looks stressful and it looks very intense. Is that the case? Well, I guess if you're in the hot, when you're in the hot seat, of course, but <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of time, it's just you know, it's the, the process. Okay. And everybody gets a little uncool at times, but it doesn't yeah. matter. That's just the way it is. When did you start doing ambient music? Oh, two thousand six, something like that. I just plugged in everything. 
just on a whim, you know, I had a couple little amps and a delay and I started putting everything together and I would like make a noise and walk away and listen to it and come back and go, oh yeah, I, I kind of like this. My wife got me going on it really. Like Mark Farner said, she's my better three quarters. That's right. That's that right. Line. Yeah. But yeah, she really is, the, got me going on it. Well, your first album of, of ambient music came out in 2012. So were you, did you intend? It took me a while to do anything. Yeah. With it. But then Etsy came along. It's like, hey, you could make a CD and sell it. There's actually a good market for what's considered, you know, handmade limited edition things like that. Yeah, it's okay. Among collectors, I would imagine anyway. Right, right. I mean, I have my fan base, I guess. Yeah. Which is still in double digits, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. And a lot of it is on Bandcamp now, which is great. Because now people oh, yeah. can pick and, it up. Yeah, it. And I make, you know, I do the cards and I give away a lot of stuff, of course. Oh, see, I love, I, yeah, I love Bandcamp. It's, to me, it's, and then Bandcamp Fridays where they give all the proceeds go directly to the artist. Yeah. All right. I've got a, another question here. Uh, another guest that I had on recently is uh, Justin Greaves from uh, Cripple Black Phoenix. Okay. I told him you were coming on. He had a few questions. He said, uh, Children of God through the Great Annihilator is his favorite Swans period, but he's heard that it's not many of the band members' favorite period. And so he wanted to know how much of that negative opinion is from the band. Like, or do a lot of, or do you in particular have a positive or not so positive view of that time period and the music that came out of it? Well, it's positive. I was on tour all the time. Yeah. You know, we toured, we played. It was great. He also wanted to know um, standard tuning. He said concert pitch is underrated. Do you agree or not agree? <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of the early Swan stuff, I'm not in standard tuning anyway. So Okay. But since I know, like, we got into a lot of open tunings, but it just, I would be lost. I have no idea what I'm doing. So I would take, like, the open tuning songs and figure out how to play them in standard tuning. Oh, wow. And then, uh, yeah, I had a couple of things. I would drop the low E to a D sharp and then raise the G string a half a step just so that when I hit a harmonic, it was just this horrible sound. <laughs> that is and awesome. That that. That's the, uh, you know, cop and filth era kind of thing. And finally, his last question is rollerball or a THX 1138? those strings so i'm assuming uh, i'm assuming he wants to know if you're a george lucas fan oh oh i see um i have no idea i loved rollerball when i was a kid i haven't seen it in a million years no i mean i, I think i've seen rollerball once in thx 1138 twice and i did a, per, a performance once with once with thx with uh you know uh stuart argobright he did the song "The Dominatrix Sleeps Tonight." No, it was a big dance hit back in the uh, early '80s. Okay, and uh, I did a performance with him. He does a lot of ambient. It was in a restaurant that had four big screens, and you sit on the floor and eat and watch movies. And we were set up in the middle playing music along to THX. Oh wow! And then we did uh, "Alien." Oh, the first one. Really? Yeah, we did that. That was the second. That was called the Dystopians. And I think you can find that on YouTube as well. One All of right. those. I'm those making those. a. Note. That was early for me. That was really. I think I had already done like my first foray into playing on my own with weird noises, and that was very early. Okay. 
And I, d- I didn't realize that you were a fan of uh, roller skate, disco, and techno. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Yes, I guess techno is too unlimited techno. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> it's, more like, uh, it's more like roller Italian roller disco. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of a lot of other stuff. Oh, that's awesome. And you have, all right, so, and I don't, I am a very poor amateur guitar player, so I can't, I don't know a lot about guitar woods and all, but you do have a guitar made of mesquite? I do. How do Harris gave me a body, this body. Wow. Oh, that's that body. beautiful. And I said, I, I, you know, my, my dream guitar, of course, is the Johnny Thunders, Les Paul Jr. Yeah. Of course, those are, they're, they're untouchable. Yeah. Whereas back then, you know, they'd always say you get them for $75. Yeah. <laughs> and so Thor gave me this body, like, pretty early when I met him. He was on tour with Shearwater, and he came through New York and gave me the body, and it sat there forever. And I, I bought the next, but I didn't do anything with it. Okay. And then, you know, COVID happens. I'm like, I need something to do. And I went ahead and bought the parts. And I work at a music store, but I didn't want the luthiers to help me. Uh. I'd ask them questions about how to do some stuff. And they would give me advice. They'd always say, oh, bring it in. I'm like, no, no. I have to do it my own way at home with, <laughs> like, toothpicks. Right. You know, ball peen hammer, basically. <laughs> so I did it. And this guitar is amazing sounding. Is it? Because I, I don't remember ever hearing of mesquite being used very often for guitar bodies. It's super heavy and it, it's really dense. When you route it, it doesn't, it, it like, it's dust. Oh, it's, wow. It's very dry, but it sustains forever. I put a different pickup in it. Uh, it didn't sound as good. So uh-huh. I put this one back in. This is a weird old DiMarzio that was in... Uh, a guitar that I, I got at one point. Man, it, it's beautiful. It looks almost like it's leather. It's just gorgeous. I Finish. love wood. Thor did all the work on the body. Wow. You know, cutting it out and polishing it and doing everything with it. You know, you would never paint it. And it smelled really good when you're <laughs> drilling and cutting, you know. <laughs> yeah. Was, okay. But yeah, this is the first guitar. Well, the second guitar I made. The first one was when I was a kid. Oh, really? It didn't work out, didn't work out so well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's the Mesquite guitar. Oh, that is beautiful. And I play it with Al and Vinny because we still play when we're all around. And it does sound, it's heavy though. That's one of the downsides. Oh, it's man. It's the heaviest guitar. So, you know, it's less Paul heavy. So when you play out uh, and you're doing your ambient stuff, is it, improvisational or are you uh... I call it planned improv okay I have a vague idea I have an idea what I'm going to do and I have sections where I say okay I'm, I'm moving into this part now and we'll see what happens okay because I always have a like I said not being a musician myself I it's interesting to me to hear how you would recreate something on an ambient album live I'm not I, I don't do that yeah uh, Okay. I, I, there's a couple of things like I go, well, I actually did a couple of songs. Like there's a couple ideas that I kind of recreate, not note for note. Right. But okay. if you know the records, you go, oh yeah, it's that one. And I don't stop when I play either. So I'm not playing a song and then stopping. I just play so straight through. So it's like 30, 45 minutes if you just straight. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And then it goes up and down depending on my mood too, depending on like maybe the rental amps are a little dirtier. Yeah. So I, I change, I find things I like. Okay. I really enjoyed Moonstar by Magic Crystal Dirt. Oh, how funny. Was that your idea or was that your daughter's idea? That's my idea. 
I thought that was great. Because we, we wanted to, we worked on some other songs too, but I would say, okay, it's time to record. And she'd go, I'm over that one. <laughs> like, no, okay. So we never did another thing. Oh, man. We worked on some stuff, but that was the, I, I surprised you a little. That was quite a few years ago. I found something out and then it's, it's listed as Norman Westberg. So I'm going to ask you about this. I don't know what the hell it is. It's something it's labeled as attention span, all and nothing. And it's like a 10 second clip. A- Short attention span. Yeah, it's A T T N colon span, and like, like every track on it is like ten seconds long or something like. Yeah. It's like oh, a billion tracks on it. That's not the life. That's called blinked. There's another one that you're supposed to. We did. I think that was thirty seconds though. <laughs> Two thirty second tracks. Oh of wow. Birth and death. It's. I'm trying to remember where I saw that. Was that that may have been on. Yeah. Band- the, Rings a bell. Let me see if I can Let find it. Because I, I definitely recorded it. It's going to be and, a race uh, now. I'm going to look in the hard drive and see if I can. <laughs> find it. Thank God for editing. That was pretty cool. I remember what the. I'm not was. like since I'm older, my uh, the way I do a uh, file system, <laughs> even though I worked in an office, is pretty rough. <laughs> All right, so I see it here. It just says. Norman Westberg, All and Nothing, and it is, and it's a weird cover. Yeah, I think that has something to do with short attention span. They wanted, like, yeah, like literally, like ten, your best 10 seconds. Yes, this is a compilation of 10 second tracks by Attention Magazine designed for shuffle playback. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there it is. It is called Brink. Oh, no, attention span is different. Brink's a different one. Brink is, it's the same people, I believe. Okay. Um, Brink was the life and death one. Oh, I didn't see that. I don't have to look that up. There's you're supposed to do the first minute of life and the last minute. Oh. Just as you die, the last minute of life. Wow. And it came on a really cool flash drive. Oh wow. And there is um it's a laundry list. I mean, there are so many people on that thing. <laughs> Attention span. Once again, it's a lot of people. Yeah, 10 seconds. Everything's 10 seconds. Yeah, that was really fun. And there's a ton, yeah, there's a ton of people on that one. And so, you only did one for that one. So is that, are they reaching out to you? Or... Oh, there you go. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so are they reaching out to, to you or do you know these guys and, and this project and you're saying, hey, I, I can do that? People write me, and I, I like the Brink one. So when they wrote for another one, it's like, yeah, I, I want to do that. Oh, that's awesome. And they send me, you know, I get the, if it's a physical thing, they'll send a copy. Well, I'm going to try to put something together, and I'll, I'll, when I do, I'm going to reach out to you and see if you're interested. Yeah, I like doing that. I mean, it's easy nowadays. I, you know, I have the recording set up. I can come up with something. It's not the same as sitting in a room with somebody and you know doing the thing right and you just had another release this year uh first man in the moon oh yes with uh Yasek. yes how did that come about and uh what is he open for swans he's an upright bass player oh. who does the electronics oh wow and he he opened i think it was in russia a couple shows and uh i sat on the side of the stage i thought he was really good I liked him and talked to him. He goes, oh, we should do something. This is years ago. And um, we talked about it. And it's like, oh, yeah, we can exchange tracks. But nothing ever happened. And then I was doing the solo tour with Michael before COVID, I guess, 2019. And um, he wrote me and said, oh, I see you're playing two nights in Warsaw. Can I get a studio for the first day? And we'll record. And that's what we did. We set up everything. We recorded that day. And then he did, you know, he mixed and did whatever and then sent me the tracks. 
And I know uh, Remo Sealand in Switzerland with their label, Hallow Ground. I've done oh. stuff with him before. I sent him all of them and said, what do you think? And he goes, yes, I want to do, let's do these tracks, you know, to be a vinyl record. People really like that record. I like that record. It's yeah. good. And it was fun to do. And it's, it was Yasek's trip. He put everything together. He <laughs> organized it. All I did was have the connection to the label. So have you been able to play much recently? I know New York is a little... You never know. Tour in Ireland. Went to Ireland a couple weeks ago. Oh, awesome. And that was four shows, you know, four nights in a row. Oh, wow. It was really nice. Because I have... This other thing that came out, I have it right here, oh, right on Drag Acid. Oh, Drag, okay. And he brought me over. Uh, this is in Dragada in Ireland. Oh, wow. And he brought me over because I was looking at, because the Swans tour didn't happen. Yeah. That tour, I had already bought my ticket with Lufthansa. Oh. So I had this ticket that I kept postponing and they were letting me do it, but they were saying it's ending now that things are opening. Yeah. So I was kind of looking for somebody who could do something and he got me a gig. Oh. And then my booking agent got me three more gigs and my host, Brian Hegarty drove me around too. <laughs> and we hung out together. It was really fun. We had a great time. I had a great time. I think he did too. I think he enjoyed himself. Do you have new music in the works, new releases coming up? Not really. I'm still working on things. I made a CD just for the Irish tour. I haven't put it up yet, and I will. It might be, like I, I say in the sleeve, it's maybe works in progress. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, because part of the thing I like is I don't want to do a lot of overdubs. I want it just to be, this is it. This is what I do. I'm talking to you. I'm not having like 20 different things coming in. Right. I like the kind of purity of this is exactly what happened. So is that how you build stuff? The, the ambient music that you release, is it all minimal overdubbing on, on the uh, CD? No overdubbing. Wow. I don't open it. That's the record I did for Lawrence, Room 40. Mm -hmm. Record after vacation is a different. It's parts that okay. he put together, and there's overdubbing. stuff i really like it will work i'm theoretically working on another record with him oh cool i'm yeah. supposed to be working on it <laughs> <laughs> i am i'm trying I, i've sent him tracks and well you're not we'll podcasting see. with with guys when, no <laughs> <laughs> well when i've kept you for quite a while thank you so much for spending your evening with me is there a website or a social media presence and band camp page that people can follow you at Ah, uh, Norman Westberg. I'm on Bandcamp, and I'm on Facebook. I'm very easy to find. I'm on Instagram. I don't post a lot on Instagram, but uh, yeah, I think a lot of people find me. I guess you did too through yeah. Facebook. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So people find me there, and I don't say yes to everything. I kind of, you know, go by how people come off. Even on that, yeah, you know, <laughs> well, limited thing. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I really do appreciate it, and that means so much. Excellent.